Great. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the uh, EO Cafe, where the EO community meet. Um, this week, we have a, a really interesting subject um, to talk about the, uh, the way that the media uses EO and uh, how uh, we can help the EO, uh, the, the, um, the media, make better use of the uh, resources that we have on, on offer. We have two real expert guests to talk about this. But first, let me just uh, remind everyone about the rules of engagement. So um, this is a conversation with our two invited guests, our two special guests. Um, everyone else, um, you, will, you, you can listen in to, uh, to our conversation. And later on, you can join in. Um, please put any questions you have into the chat. But uh, at the appropriate time, I'll call on you to, uh, to ask your question, to open up your microphone and ask the question. Um, other than that, please keep microphones off. But if you want to keep your camera on, we do encourage it so that everyone can see people and it makes it a, a more social uh, occasion, which after all was the uh, original goal of, uh, of the EO Cafe. So we have a really um, fantastic weather here in Brussels. It's, uh, it's 20 degrees and the sun's shining and it's very unusual. Uh, so I guess People might prefer to be outside rather than here. But anyway, we're, we're in the EO Cafe. And I'm sure we're going to have a very interesting discussion. So the two guests we have, um, Jonathan Tirona is um, from Bloomberg. He's a news editor based in Austria. Um, Bloomberg, I'm sure you're aware, is one of the foremost companies in the world uh, supplying business and financial data to global decision makers. Jonathan has regularly used satellite imagery um, over the last uh, decade to break stories concerning climate, energy, and technology, which are his main subject, and has recently been introducing um, Copernicus into the newsroom. Our second guest probably needs no introduction because most of you know, uh, know Remco. Um, Remco is a freelance specialist in social media and defines, manages creative social media um, for a number of uh, organizations dealing with space and space technology in, in, in the European space industry. And in 2020, he was selected as the hashtag EU influencer for space. So welcome both of you. Um, I'll give you the floor in a, in a minute to introduce yourselves a bit further. But firstly, let me just um, capture the, the sense of the, of the subject I and mean, it's satellite imagery. I think media was probably one of the first users of satellite imagery. If I, if I step outside the military, um, who of course were the, um, uh, the, the, the backbone in the, in the early days. Um, but satellite imagery has been used by the media uh, since the 1970s, 1980s, uh, Landsat, uh, Spot. And I certainly recall newspapers and Sunday magazines uh, full of images of a, from around the world illustrating the, uh, the power and uh, educating people. Um, they were mainly used as an illustration for stories. I can think of uh, oil spills as an example, the uh, Exxon Valdez, the Prestige, the Erica, the Deepwater Horizon in 2010, the Gulf Wars, 1991 and 2003, a lot of imagery used at that time. And then of course, recently we've seen a, almost a media frenzy um, over the um, over the ever given and the ship uh, and it's been a, a fascinating um, period to compare the different images that have been uh, put up uh, the different resolutions the different angles the different technologies even SAR images being used um, and uh, illustrating how much SAR needs to be interpreted and helped with uh, understanding what's what's going on uh, maybe I'll come to a, a story about that later. But imagery is not just used for illustrating. Um, it's also been used for investigative journalism. And there's a few examples that I imagine we'll, we'll hear about in the course of the afternoon. So now um, let me uh, allow each of the speakers to introduce themselves further and to give a first perspective on the subject from their uh, their point of view. So uh, first of all, let me uh, hand over to, to Jonathan. I think uh, both our speakers have a few slides to share. So we'll uh, we'll go through those. And uh, Jonathan, the, uh, the floor is yours. 
Thanks, Jeff. And thank you very much for the invitation to share some thoughts. I'm uh, honestly much more interested in hearing and learning from the uh, attendees who have much more experience than I do, I'm certain. Uh, I guess the first thing I'd say is <laughs> that, um, you know, I, I, I was thinking about how to put remote sensing into perspective of my job as a journalist based here in Austria. And I kind of compare, compare it to um, learning German. And uh, that is to say my skills are ziemlich schlecht, but uh, that anybody who learns a second language knows that um, even speaking a second language poorly can um, bring you very many enriching uh, experiences and fortuitous experiences as long as the uh, user is willing to continue learning. And so that's where I am with remote sensing. And I'll share a few slides that are prepared to give you an idea of how I've been using it over the years. Uh, if I can share the screen here, there we are, I think. So, So I'm based in Vienna and my primary job when I got here was to cover the International Atomic Energy Agency and the Iran um, issue way back in 2004 was active just as it is in 2021. And um, I mean, my first this is this is the, 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 these are the very first images that I actually started to uh, work with. Um, uh, it was Twelve years ago, um, getting bespoken imagery was not easy for me at that time. This is an image of the Gachin uranium mine in uh, Iran. Uh, it's, a, it's 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 in the south near the Gulf Coast. It's the only working mine and. Uh, it's significant for me because it was the first, and I also remember how difficult it was to um, get buy-in from the newsroom because, uh, you know, just in the last 12 years, uh, newsroom comfort with remote sensing has advanced exponentially. And... 12 years ago, it was still kind of an arcane science that um, uh, in, in an investigative piece like this was kind of the domain of um, governments uh, and interest groups. So even though um, satellite images of Iran's nuclear program had appeared in the past, they were usually led by people who had easier access to imagery. I flipped it on the head, uh, I flipped that cycle on his head here in that I first learned that Iran was expanding a uranium mine and um, then went and identified it uh, with geo coordinates and went to Digital Globe at the time and requested the imagery and then found the experts who could help me and walk me through explaining what is going on. And you can see very clearly here, uh, the tailing ponds are uh, being expanded and uh, filling up. That was important at the time because it, it explained in a very clear way why what's called the additional protocol, which allows for wider um, inspections, is so crucial in the Iran story. Moving on. Oh, let me see here. This is another story that also involves the additional protocol. This is um, from Saudi Arabia now, uh, uh, the neighbor in Iran. This again involves International Atomic Energy Agency um, inspections. Uh, this was interesting and I was first to report this one. This is interesting because of the triangulation exercise uh, I was able to go through. 
what you're seeing on the left hand side is the containment vessel for a it's a very tiny um, research reactor that's being built in um, Riyadh. Uh, but the issue here for a journalist um, is, and, and, and for the International Atomic Energy Agency, is that before that uh, research reactor can be uh, operated, uh, Saudi Arabia has to implement um, the uh, uh, inspection agreements that allow it to import the fuel, so the enriched uranium. So what you see on the right hand side is uh, the greenfield site and then the stages of uh, construction and you know it's a it's a poor image, um, but you can actually see the cylinder installed at the bottom at the in, in the bottom panel. This is something that uh, you know. Google Earth <laughs> could satisfy uh, at that stage. Um, I've subsequently, you know, continued to follow it. Um, and if you go to Google Earth, uh, you'll see a, um, uh, you know, <laughs> much higher rate of uh, imaging of this site um, uh, because it has subsequently become a place of interest uh, internationally. And these are some of the more recent examples of how we at Bloomberg, I at Bloomberg over the last year have been using remote sensing. Um, the left-hand side shows uh, the port in Germany on the Baltic where uh, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline uh, is um, uh, putting its inventory of pipes. And in May, um, the uh, Russian pipeline ship, it's a very special ship, uh, left the Sea of Japan, came around the Horn of Africa, and finally arrived on May 10th uh, off the coast of Mukran. And so that um, gave me an opportunity to use satellite imagery to kind of illustrate uh, why that ship was there. Um, it's kind of boring, frankly, unless a ship gets stuck in the canal. I mean, that never happens, but um, uh, it's kind of boring just to write a story about a ship coming to, into a port and, um, you know, being able to kind of explain how and why that ship had a purpose there um, um, made the story more interesting. Same up there for the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. I broke no ground there. I don't even think I was the first one to come out with the satellite images from planet. Um, I'm flagging this only because um, uh, I managed to get in touch with two, you know, um, uh, specialists um, in satellite imagery analysis who worked in uh, uh, with dams uh, specifically that is often the hardest part for bloom uh, for, for a journalist these days it's not necessarily to get the satellite imagery but to get the uh, experts who give it context and have been at the industrial sites to give it meaning and then finally down at the bottom we have um, you know, you've probably seen it, Copernicus, uh, the great Saharan dust um, um, uh, plume that blew over and painted uh, European mountains and ski ranges, uh, a beautiful pink in the, it, I think it was in February. Oops, I just ended that prematurely. Uh, where did that go? <laughs> Hope you can get back. Yes, there it is. Okay. Uh, uh, it's not shared at the moment. Stop sharing. There we, oh, no. There we are. And can you see it now? No. No, not yet. Uh, <laughs> it's coming. There we go. Okay. Right. So, yeah, I'll, I'll just conclude. Um, uh, so I'm working a lot with Copernicus now. Um, beautiful imagery. Uh, every time 
we write about climate at Bloomberg. Uh, one of my first destinations is the ESA website, looking for uh, Copernicus images that can decorate our climate change stories. Um, you know, in terms of data, uh, we really saw at the beginning of the coronavirus lockdown how um, remote sensing data uh, can really be impactful. Um, we were measuring NO2 um, emissions uh, in China, seeing, you know, it's, 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 it's the typical kind of horse race game of who's getting, who's opening up first. And obviously emissions data is very important there. Um, each time that we're, we're writing about um, uh, uh, sea level rise uh, forecast scenarios in the future, vis-a-vis uh, -vis critical in infrastructure. I mean, these are all things that rely on uh, remote sensing data. And the list goes on and on, droughts, fires, inland waterway transport. Um, and that goes into the next um, uh, area. I think that, you know, there's actually a story developing of remote sensing uh, industry as, as a discrete entity. Um, you know, we saw um, what's the Silicon Valley um, uh, fund, the ARC fund, they just uh, uh, started up a space fund, a space ETF. I mean, you can conceivably imagine some uh, remote sensing uh, data companies, uh, you know, finding a place there. Um, and so the final word would be the limitation in newsrooms right now, from my observation, is really just... Uh, um, processing the big data. So just like everybody else, uh, you know, I think probably the next generation of journalists will be, um, you know, integrating Python skills <laughs> uh, and how to manage big data um, uh, with, you know, traditional techniques of writing or video production. So yeah. I'll leave it there and happy to talk after hearing <laughs> Question. Yeah, thanks, Thank you thanks very much. Jonathan. I think uh, things have certainly moved on a lot since I uh, I started in the sector, and uh, I think they're moving on very fast again. I think you're absolutely right. We we had an interesting discussion when we first uh, talked about this about the uh, the industry and uh, how that was that was evolving, and uh, we maybe come back to that another time. Um, so now uh, I hand over to. Uh, uh, the face we all know, Remco. Um, Remco, uh, there, there was a balance between the speakers. So Jonathan is more sort of, uh, if I dare say, mainstream media, though Bloomberg is not really uh, mainstream media. Um, and Remco is much more the social media expert. So Remco, give us your, your perspective on EO in the news. Sure. Well, thank you very much, first of all, for uh, inviting me. And thank you, Jonathan, for that, uh, for that great intro on the Bloomberg and, and probably your more personal view on, uh, on the use of, uh, of EO data in, in the media. Um, and I will actually pick it up where you left it, where you, you uh, promoted the uh, increase of knowledge of uh, big data processing knowledge uh, with journalists. And, and I would actually um, argue that that is a job for the EO industry itself, because it's something that we don't only hear from the media, but also from many potential users of Earth observation data. And I'm sure we all know this uh, quite well, is that uh, we have a lot of data, um, but it's turning that data into information and presenting it to the industry, to society in such a way that it can easily be picked up. I don't necessarily think that skill should be with the journalists, but I think that skill should be with the EO industry itself. And uh, I actually have a few very nice examples of, um, of what that could look like. So uh, let me share my screen here. Uh, let me see which one is it, this one here. Share, switch that to Presentation view. Okay, I'm sure you can see my screen right now. Um, so first of all, let me introduce myself with this very generic slide um, of the event itself. My name is Remco Timmermans. I'm a freelance social media specialist for space. Um, those of you active on social media may have seen some of my stuff, but I do a lot of work for uh, um, lots of organizations without anyone realizing that it's me behind the social media accounts of those organizations, including a few in uh, Earth Observation, and I'll actually mention 
a few of those in my presentation. Um, but let me start here. This is going back to 2014. This is really the first time that I got uh, knowledge about uh, how Earth observation can help investigative journalism. And this is um, an organization called Bellingcat, which is uh, an organization that specializes in doing this intricate investigative journalism. It was founded by Elliot Higgins, who wrote this piece in 2014, which got a little bit of media attention. That's where I picked it up, where um, he actually turned around something that we are very used to in Earth observation, which is um, um, proofing in situ proofing of space data on the ground. And, and they were among the first ones who turned that around, who took images, mostly from social media, of the war in Syria. When the war in Syria broke out um, um, almost a decade ago, there were lots of images. And what Bellingcat was doing is uh, prove whether these videos were real or not, in order to make sure that we didn't repeat the mistakes that we did in the Gulf War, and, and making sure that what we saw here and that was presented to us was actually the real picture. And they used uh, satellite imagery for that. And uh, they developed a whole mechanism, a whole method, which is explained in this article. I, I have the link here at the bottom, if you're interested, uh, through Bellingcat. Uh, they developed a whole methodology on how to um, uh, map locations that you see in videos um, on satellite images to see if these locations are real and these situations that are presented are actually in the location that they're claimed to be at. Very interesting. This was the first time I got involved in that. And Bellingcat, of course, is still active. Uh, they make media headlines quite often with revelations, with new discoveries, um, like these ones, very recent. Uh, this is one of the Bellingcat uh, staff who posted pictures on uh, the war situation in Ethiopia. And even yesterday, the right tweet was from a situation in Syria, in the city of Raqqa, where uh, certain things are developing. So um, very interesting to follow those people on social media. And, and they use um, um, Earth observation data to basically space proof what they find on the ground. So uh, just the reverse from what we're used to. Another situation that made headlines um, a while ago was this massive iceberg. Suddenly icebergs made the news. When, when did icebergs make the news uh, over the last decades? It's, it's a recent thing because we can see them from space. And uh, some journalists are, um, are finding out about this, uh, not because the imagery is new, because we've had these space images from, from meteorological satellites for a long time, but because the data is becoming more accessible. And this links to uh, what I was saying at the beginning, that the data is not becoming more available, but the data is becoming more accessible to people, more understandable. It's no more, not, not, so, not so much data, it's much more information that is provided in bite-sized chunks for uh, society to understand. And this iceberg is a, is a great example of that, especially when it was on a collision course with the South Georgia Islands. Um, it, it, it made quite a bit of a uh, well, headline, I should say, on social media. And this was picked up by, uh, by the traditional media. This is uh, um, a Dutch weatherman who is known for using Copernicus data to point out certain weather phenomena all around the world, and, and it includes icebergs. He was one of the first to bring this satellite imagery uh, into the main uh, um, weather uh, announcements on TV. And this is a picture of him pointing out the uh, Brunt ice shelf that broke loose from Antarctica. Similarly, we saw the images of volcanoes. Volcanoes are certainly in the news. Well, volcanoes are not new. They, they were there well before humans roamed on Earth, but suddenly they're making the news. Uh, we had the situation in 2010 with uh, the Eyjafjallajökull, difficult name on Iceland, which uh, halted all the, uh, all the air, air traffic. And now we have these uh, um, volcanoes again erupting all over Iceland. And of course, Earth observation is the first way to, uh, to pinpoint the exact locations and to help assess uh, the risks of that and which other medium than social media to very quickly distribute those, uh, that information uh, to the world. Uh, it becomes much more interesting, and these are pictures from yesterday, uh, it becomes much more interesting when um, you combine the information that you see from space with the human side of things. So this is that same uh, volcano in Iceland, 
And this is how the Icelandic population responds to it. And if you put these two pictures together, you, you bring things into perspective. And again, the people who go to this location, uh, they're not shy of sharing that on social media and combining that with the earth observation data makes for an interesting story told on social media. Now, again, uh, to the point I was making in, in the beginning, how can you make that massive amount of space data interesting and appealing? And this is something uh, that I've seen recently is the application of uh, 3D um, uh, tools of, of new uh, data visualization tools that allows us to put these space uh, pictures in a more human um, um, perspective. And by showing us these uh, pictures of volcanoes, in this case, uh, a recent uh, volcano eruption in Russia, um, but if you put it into a human perspective, showing the mountains as they are in a 3D way, it comes to life and people have a much better image than, um, than when it's just flat 2D information. Now, of course, we all heard about this story. I mean, Jeff opened with this one. And um, the interesting thing about the Ever Given, which, which was a maritime disaster in, in a certain way, where there was no shortage of pictures from the ground, but it kind of triggered something in the earth observation sector. And I published something about this yesterday, and I'll show you the link after this, but it's kind of a story where first space information, space data like this uh, was used to, uh, to give people a big picture of what was happening. They showed the ship uh, blocking the channel and they showed uh, the ships that were uh, waiting on both entries, but it kind of got a life on its own and it became a showcase of what the satellite industry and what the earth observation sector is actually capable of in 2021. And that was the aspect that I picked up, uh, especially on social media, because you saw these companies kind of competing. It started with Copernicus data, with Sentinel-2, which isn't very uh, um, high resolution, but it is good enough to paint the picture. But then you saw other companies jumping in and saying, hey, but we have much bigger, uh, much better pictures. So Airbus was the first one using an image from the Pleiades, from one of the Pleiades uh, satellites that suddenly gave us a level of detail that is rarely seen in, um, in commercial applications in, in 3D. And then other companies jumped in. We saw Maxar with their GUI, 0.41 meter resolution, zooming in on the actual problem, zooming in not on the whole ship, but just on the bow of the ship stuck in the sand. And then we saw the SAR, the, the, the radar satellite operators jumping in to showcase their technology and their added value by looking through clouds and giving us pictures uh, during the night, which the optical competitors obviously couldn't do. And uh, we had the first satellite flying over the moment the ship broke loose. As you can see, it's no longer stuck here, but it's being pulled backwards out of the sand. And yes, 700 kilometers above the scene, there was a satellite uh, picking up that exact moment and the company not being shy about publishing this straight onto social media. And I'm sure these pictures made it to, uh, to mainstream media all around the world. So if you wanna read more about this, uh, I published something about this on groundstation.space. So have a look there uh, for the full story because it's much more images than, uh, than the ones I just showed there. Um, there's lots of these stories and there's lots of people. And that's the reason why I'm showing you this. There's lots of people either professionally or even in their spare time um, working on earth observation data to turning it into information that society can consume, that putting it on a, on a, on a, on a plate, if you like, that is ready to be used by uh, either mainstream media or, or on social media. And uh, of course the, the two people who are, who are most prominently doing this, uh, at least on Twitter at the moment, Pierre Marcuse and Antonio Vecoli. If you don't follow them on Twitter, please do so because they are among these people who help us make that last step in the translation of, uh, of raw earth observation data into very attractive 2D, 3D, full color, all kinds of different pictures. And uh, especially Pierre Marcuse who puts lots of his images on a, on a Flickr page. Uh, that I would say is ready for mainstream media to pick up straight away. And, and, and the stories are told within the pictures because they are so well presented. Um, anyway, this is just my personal view of uh, a few people that I think you should follow on social media who talk a lot about this. 
And uh, with that, I would like to open it for discussion. So okay, thanks, 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 Remco. I mean, it's uh, it, it's it's a subject that's really evolved um, and and very quickly over the last few years. Um, do you both find you get sufficient support from the industry, um, you know, access to to imagery, you know, your quality, time? Um, analytical uh, skills. I think you you made the point, Remco, that probably you know there should be more engagement from the sort of the value added side and uh, you know to support. What's your perspective on that? Uh, that now, Jonathan. Um, it's hit or miss. I, I I mean I'll give you a specific example. Um, a call. I was helping a colleague uh, in Africa work on a uh, story verifying some. You know, um, uh, carbon offset cert certificates, uh, you know, this is a thing now, um, you know, planting trees to offset emissions uh, in other economies. And there were some questions around, um, you know, whether the work was going on as uh, advertised. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, 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 unfortunately, my technical skills in, um, you know, kind of trying to render uh, some of the organic mass um, data available through Copernicus are not um, adequate. And when I contacted some of the remote sensing vendors, um, they were um, commercially um, connected with uh, some of the projects. Mm -hmm. So I think this is, you know, kind of an issue um, when you get into some of the investigation pieces, uh, you see that, um, you know, it's a, it's a community. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fairly tight knit community sometimes. Um, and so that's something to overcome. Mm. Okay. And, uh, Remco? Yeah, I, I, I kind of agree with that. Um, but I also see a trend of some of these platforms. I'm, I'm, I'm not, a, not an earth observation specialist uh, by any means. Um, I, I, I usually just take what other people uh, that I just showed uh, produce and, and repeat the message and tell the stories around it. Um, but I also try to get some of this, these images myself. And what I'm seeing is that it is very, very slowly becoming more accessible. There are portals now. Um, um, out there, um, um, Sentinel Hub um, as, as just an example, but there's quite a few of these portals out there who are making it m easier and easier for people like myself who are not Earth Observation Specialists. Um, um, my specialization is, is social media marketing, uh, so I, I don't have the technical skills to do all this data processing, nor do I want to develop those mm -hmm. skills necessarily. Yeah. Um, but I do see that these portals are becoming more and more helpful. Uh, a lot of development has gone into these portals because obviously the Copernicus program, many terabytes a day, and they want people to, to, to pick up this data and do something useful with it. Um, but I don't think they can expect people like myself, people like Jonathan, basically anyone who can develop applications, be it for journalism or be it for other uh, industries to do that themselves. So I do think that development should continue and these portals should be should become easier to use, more and more self-explanatory. Um, and and we're, we're, we're only in very difficult, very specific situations, you would need the help from these specialists. But um, I, 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 I do see a good development there, but we're not there yet. And I guess it's a question of, uh, of, of interest, whether you, uh, you want to develop more of those skills yourselves. But the, uh, the imagery suppliers, I think some of, the, some of them now setting up uh, sort of media desks, aren't they, to, to help with that, uh, some of that problem and some of the interpretation as well. Do, the, do, they, do they help with analysis or is it purely supply of imagery? Yeah. So uh, on the imagery side, it's definitely a lot easier to get um, high quality, high resolution images in a timely manner. And uh, for, you know, basic stuff, you can rely on analysis uh, with some of the more complex, you know, things around international nuclear verification rules uh, and, uh, you know, people who actually have firsthand experience at a nuclear site to identify, you know, uh, one building from another, you know, that's, that, that, that's something that requires, you know, investment of journalistic time and resources to, to, to mm -hmm. get those kinds of people. Um, and just 
briefly to the point about um, the portals and platforms that are doing um, um, uh, data analysis. I completely agree with Remco. There's a lot of good stuff out there. The issue I still have is continuity of supply, because mm. as we know, you know, a static image is not um, uh, nearly as valuable as being able to compare, uh, uh, you know, images over time. And what you, what, what I see is, um, you know, there's a lot of early stage companies that, um, you know, either for lack of funding or lack of, um, um, uh, you know, a labor force, just cannot um, um, uh, supply consistently the kinds of imagery, you know, that 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 we need as a newsroom. Mm. So. That's an observation. Mm. So the resources are not not really there yet. Any anything, Remco? Or uh... um, yeah, I I I see the same. Um, the, the type of clients that I work with, uh, they simply uh, don't have the resources to use these commercial suppliers. So I, I very much rely for many of the situations that that I deal with with my clients on these portals where I can get this information for free, and I, I probably don't need the level of detail or the the intrinsic stories uh, or extensive stories that uh, that Jonathan is looking for. Um, so I, I, I depend on these portals. And what I do see is that the successful portals are usually that like the national ones or even the international ones, yeah. and not so much the ones that are developed, unfortunately, by by small startups who may have very innovative ideas. But uh, as Jonathan said, not the uh, resources uh, for whatever reason, to uh, to push this through and make this work on the long time. Sure, I guess the the, the sort of budget for marketing type activities is uh, is much more restrict much more restricted. How um how's COVID played out? I mean, you mentioned it, Jonathan, and looking at the uh, air quality in China and uh, um, a means to sort of try to understand how activity was uh, was was restarting. Um, ESA and the Commission set up the uh, the race dashboard. Um, has has that proved useful to you as in the time of COVID? Uh, I mean, you know, COVID was a goldmine for remote sensing. We were all locked in our our homes, so there was really no other way to figure out what was going on than remote sensing. <laughs> so, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, editors had a uh, you know newsrooms had kind of. Um, you know, renewed interest in what satellite imagery could uh, explain about the world. And, uh, you know, pollution was already creeping into, um, you know, news coverage as, um, you know, a metric standing in for admissions. And, um, you know, that just took off um, uh, with COVID as a leading indicator for return to normal, whatever that is. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and I'll just make the point here briefly. I mean, we're really excited, uh, especially looking at some of the uh, Green Deal and EU regulations under development about uh, carbon border tax or greenhouse gas border okay. taxes. Um, some of the new constellations looking at methane and uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, I mean, that's going to be really a game changer i think for yeah. uh, financial journalism at least okay that's just yeah i notice um jeff smith uh, is is who was listed by remco as being one of the uh, social influences so I, I better give him the floor i think jeff well, thanks, thanks very much for the name check, Renko. I mean, a uh, very illustrious company there, I feel, <laughs> uh, feel quite almost embarrassed. It's, uh, but no, that's really interesting uh, what you guys have both been saying. And the, the, the two things that sort of caught my eye really were um, this, in, this issue about having access to domain experts uh, and, you know, if, whether there's some mechanism, you know, whether through ERSC or something that, you know, access to domain experts in Earth observation could be. Uh, made easier um, because I'm probably one I'm probably not the only person on this call that often rants at the TV when they I don't know get the spatial resolution of an image wrong that they're using or um, they'll get the ownership of a satellite wrong for instance um, but yeah so there was that point but then the, the second one was um, I noticed that lots of the examples are really around visualizing um, what we'd see um, you know, if we if we were on board the satellite, so using those kind of true color or at least 
um, you know, re relatively realistic looking imagery as part of the story. And I wondered if you ever think that things like thematic information or, uh, you know, some of those information products of how things like, uh, you know, simple things like biomass or vegetation indices information, uh, whether that will play a more important role or are the majority of people still interested in seeing more of what you might call a real world or real life image? Yeah, in, in, in my opinion, um, it, it really depends on the objective that you have. And um, much of the work that I do is in public awareness and making, uh, showcasing, really showcasing the benefits and the opportunities that Earth observation has to society in general. And for that, especially using the social media channels, I have to put things in a human perspective. So for me, uh, it is the humanizing of data that works best. So for me, showing things in true color as people recognizing them, bringing it close to the world that people live in works best. Having said that, that is very different for other applications. As soon as you talk to specialists about, I don't know, agriculture, about forestry, about urban monitoring, about transport, that type of information that you're referring at, uh, which uses different spectra, uses maybe different visualizations, uh, becomes much more powerful. But for my purpose on social media, it is, it is, it is the humanizing the data that uh, makes it understandable for people. Okay. Well, I'll just jump in because yeah. I love to eat. And so humanizing uh, biomass indexes is right up my alley. <laughs> <laughs> And, and uh, you know, I mean, uh, I, I've, 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 been, I've, been, I've been trying to get my head around um, how to use some of these new data um, platforms for a story. Unfortunately, um, you know, satellite data has kind of been uh, um, uh, stovepiped into uh, precision agriculture. Uh, and that means it's either a chemical story or a tractor manufacturing story uh, for a lot of people. And uh, I think there's a new um, narrative conceivably, maybe around the common agricultural policy being negotiated or some other incentive mechanism to get, you know, normal people like farmers to use remote sensing. But uh, I don't really, uh, I, I haven't found the hook yet, but I think it's very interesting and there's, th I think there will be a space for it. <laughs> ah, we can, we can take that as a, a, as a separate subject. I think, you know, you, you mentioned precision farming, but there are many, many uh, other applications that people here would, uh, would spend the whole afternoon talking about if we, if we let them. Um, I'm just going to um, Steve Ramage, you, uh, asking about open data programs and whether they're, um, they're helping you in, in your work um, and also comment on uh, further on social media. Steve? Thanks, Jeff. Um, and I've just done a webinar. I'm not actually doing geo advertising. Um, yeah, so the, 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 there's a number of private sector open data programs, which I, I always find very limited um, and in very specialized areas. So I just wondered if either of you or both of you have engaged through those open data programs and if you found them useful in any way. Do you, do you have any particular programs in mind, Steve? Uh, <laughs> No, I mean, I mean, okay. <laughs> no names. No, okay. No <laughs> so, Remco, Jonathan, any, how familiar are you with open data programs? I'm going to mute myself there. Um, must I'm not very familiar with that term. I, I know, for example, that um, as, as, I, as I, I'm sure I mentioned, uh, maybe I didn't, uh, for example, Planet is very active in supporting investigative journalism. Mm. And they provide imagery often for free for uh, for for um, human uh, um, disaster and for for disaster management, uh, but also this famous um, um, human trafficking case that they uh, um, they kind of helped reveal. The ships um, meeting up, yeah. 
Yeah, and there's there's several situations. Yeah, not just Planet. There's there's other organisations that that do similar things, and those pictures, those images, uh, often do make it on social media. Um, in the sense that I have experienced myself with those stories. No, not really. Perhaps Jonathan uh, has more experience there. Um, yeah, I I, I I really don't. I mean, I, I can only say that um, uh, obviously um, uh, maintaining the Copernicus uh, climate change service as an uh, open source platform uh, has really revolutionized um, how climate change is covered for us in Europe. I mean, especially over the last four years, as NOAA saw, um, you know, more restrictions, maybe you could argue um, mm, on, yeah. on, on kind of like, you know, where, where, where that kind of climate information was coming on the other side of the Atlantic. So, I mean, I think that, you know, just generally, you know, having that data open and, and, and available is very important. Mm. And obviously the free part is, uh, is an advantage as well. And when, when that is indeed the case, whether it's uh, by marketing from a commercial company or um, using the free and open data of Copernicus or, or Landsat. Um, so another, another person that featured on your list Remco earlier, but uh, was disguised by a different handle. Stefan, Stefan Urovich. There's a, a, a comment to uh, to make regarding statements on platforms. Yes. Stefan. Uh, yes, so I make that comment. As some of you may know, we operate a few social media accounts for um, the European Commission, and in particular, that DEFIS underscore EU account. Uh, we do have a tailor-made service for media. So Jonathan, you can talk to us at any time. We produce on non-sensitive issues, uh, imagery, uh, on demand for journalists and media. Uh, if you want something that is sensitive, like, like war related, et cetera, as DEFIS, we cannot do it as part of that contract, but we'll do it as Space Tech Partners, the company, uh, completely outside. First point. Second point, I was very happy to see the names of a few of our frequent contributors like uh, Antonio Vecoli, Tony Veco, or Pierre Marcus, with whom we regularly work. Uh, also, I saw Adam Platform that often provides us with uh, imagery or, or uh, data. Uh, I, would, I would dispute the fact that there's an issue with the sustainability of platforms. I mean, today, Sentinel-2 data, Sentinel-1 data, Sentinel-3 is guaranteed for quite a long time. And there are existing commercial sustainable platforms. I mentioned one with Adam platform. I think they represented somebody from the company that set it up is, is, is participating today. But there's also EO Browser from Synergize that is so easy to use that I, with a political science degree and an MBA, can generate images with Sentinel uh one using different polarization etc well you need a little bit of experience but it's really easy and i can tell you there is a journalist at euro news with zero technical background that you produces his own images jonathan amos bbc produces his own images sometimes they come to us when they would like to beautify them uh, or, or get more contrast, which is also a service that we offer to journalists. But that for me is completely, completely sustainable, completely sustainable. And, and we all know, well, at least those of us who are in social media, we know that journalists fish for information outside of the usual AP, Reuters, uh, and Agence France Presse dispatch. So it can be a video done by an individual of some storm and they send a message, can we use it? Otherwise they follow accounts that regularly publish imagery. We publish a daily image of the day, which is really focused for the media when there's no news, well, we do something on melting glaciers or, or something like that, but really focused on relevant stuff for the media. There is a uh, mailing list that you can register to automatically receive the image of the day around 10 a.m. in the morning, CSET. I'm posting the link in the, um, in, the, um, in the chat, but we do use existing sustainable available platforms. Some of them really use for, easy to use. 
as I can sometimes substitute my expert colleagues when they're not available. Others that require um, that require uh, specific uh, remote sensing skills. But that's a complete revolution. The revolution is open data, mega constellations, planet, and uh, soon legion. Uh, but Pleiad and the understanding of these companies, Airbus, Planet, Maxar, EU Space Imaging, that the journalists are eager to, to use uh, satellite imagery to illustrate. So that's the first, the avalanche of data, both open and non-open, but which they will either process on demand for media or make available from archive. That's the first revolution. The second revolution is the the availability of platforms that can be used by individual citizens. And the third one is the fact there's so many representatives of the media on Twitter that are chasing for information and sending DMs. We get DMs from the Wall Street Journal, from the New York Times, from Agence France Presse, from many different organizations that are just saying, do you have something? Two days ago, we received something. That, do you have something about what's happening in Mozambique? And we answer, we can't help you. This was from AP. We can't help you be, uh, as deaf is because that's sensitive. We had a look, it's cloudy, but, but we'll be on watch on Saturday. There's a new image and we might send it to you. So don't hesitate to contact us. Okay, thanks, thanks Stefan. Um, uh, there's a number of questions uh, coming into the chat. Uh, interesting one from Dietrich, Dietrich Hans, which perhaps uh, comes under the sort of category of fake news. Um, Dietrich, do you want to uh, come in? Okay, yes, I can ask. Yes, it is coming from this category of fake news. And I was remembering, I mean, we had this issue in the first, second Gulf War, where they were saying, yes, we have a proof that they have these weapons and so on. And then the war takes place. And after all, it, it turns out that the, there was no proof for it. And I wonder how much potential does it have if this imagery, which is, of course, I, I love satellite imagery, and uh, it has a great potential, but it has maybe as well a potential to be misused, not just a remark. Mm -hmm. Any any comments, Ramco, Jonathan, at this point? Oh, I'll, I'll move on to further questions, please. <laughs> Who wants to go first? <laughs> <laughs> to Opening and closing microphones in synchronism. Trying to see to, to uh, signal each other with the uh, mute on, mute off. We we um, need another communication channel, don't we? Yeah, <laughs> in a way. Um, this is this is this is this is the kind of area that I that I touched upon uh, with with Bellingcat that I've been very impressed with how they've been able to uh, kind of debunk uh, fake war information uh, versus true war information. Um, but that that's about as far as my knowledge goes. So I, I'd really li uh, like to hear what uh, Jonathan's experience is in this. Um, well, I think it can cut both ways and I'm not prepared to go on the record with it. <laughs> I think, you, I think, I think, I think the more sensitive the story, the more important it is to get a range of analysis. And my observation is that some people will accept um, satellite imagery as proof in and of itself and may not always take the second and third steps of triangulating and verifying it and that in itself can embed false assumptions in mm. the broader public's mind mm. so it's it's tricky and that's why frankly a lot of newsrooms are very careful still, including my own with satellite imagery. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, I mean, if if somebody comes to you with a story backed up by satellite uh, imagery or even based upon uh, on the imagery, do you have do you have the means to, to validate, to check the veracity of, of that outside? Well, any, any tools, I guess. Yeah, I mean, uh, th there there are people. Yeah, I, I'm, absolutely. I mean, there 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 are, you know, well known examples of satellite analysis that, are, you know, are 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 um, incomplete. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, you know, and and that's where I guess the 
role of the journalist comes in is being able to develop a network of contacts and mm. my contacts are in the nuclear sciences mm. um and you know so that's that's my that's my narrow slice um and you know in increasingly climate change and um uh, the knock-on effects of climate change but i'm still you know learning there and developing my contact lists frankly so it's, a, it's, a, it's an acquired expertise journalistic expertise is what you're saying yeah i i i i i, I would say that is true yes yeah. <laughs> yeah i'd say that's that's even the way i see it and maybe that's that's old-fashioned or traditional that's the role of a journalist is to do that fact checking for me so i know what is true and what is not true and and I work in social media. I mean, that's that's the prime example of where everybody can put out whatever they want. And half of the images that we find on social media are manipulated in one way or another. And I haven't seen that too much with satellite information, but of course, it's very easy to manipulate these images as it is. Well, I wouldn't even say it's easy to create fake videos, yet people do it. So um, mm. for me, as a social media professional it is it is important to fact check anything i put out there um, and i wouldn't just believe anyone who comes with a picture or with a story as we all know on social media uh, because half of it is a joke um, and uh, the other half is, is is risky at least so i always go back to sources that i in my personal opinion think are reliable and that often includes professional journalists and, and newspaper sites where I know they do at least some fact checking uh, for my information. And I believe this is a skill, not just for journalists, but especially for social media users, that you should always be critical about what you see and always ask the question, is what I'm seeing real? And is this person reliable or not? And that's extremely difficult. I mean, fake, fake images are becoming harder and harder to, uh, more and more common and harder and harder to uh, to dissect and requiring quite a technical skill to get in and see at the uh, at the, the basic level whether the image has been manipulated. Um, Gaito, Gaetano, uh, Gaetano Volpe, do you, uh, do you want to come in? Just a moment. Yeah. Hello, good afternoon. Yeah, hi. Good to see you. Uh, you. Good afternoon, everyone. I have a question. Uh, we are an analytics company, so we follow with the, using our analytics the sweats crisis, using AI to detect number of ships in the in the channel. So the, my question is, uh, in based on your experience, experience of the panel. Is there space for analytics in uh, journalism, EO-based analytics to help journalists and uh, people involved in uh, article writing uh, to better understand the images and the event at the international level? Well, I, I, I heard uh, AI, machine learning, and analytics. Yes. yes. Okay. So, uh, I mean, there's definitely a spot. We have, for example, on the Bloomberg Terminal, um, uh, a vendor who supplies, um, you know, they, they, they image parking lots and they uh, use the number of cars that are in parking lots as a leading indicator for uh, retail sales in a given period of time. Uh, I think that over the last few years, um, uh, you know, electricity transmission lines, mm. uh, not only as an indicator uh, of, of, of outages conceivably, but uh, for penetration of electrification in developing um, countries. That's very interesting. Um, and there was another example, but I forgot, sorry, but yes, De um, 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 uh, it's a very interesting field. Um, uh, I think it's probably going to be more in the category of like, uh, you know, uh, trading houses and things like this. This is this is the impression I get. Like trading houses, people who are like actually like using this information on a very you know time sensitive way to um, you know make money essentially. Um, and then we will, as journalists, uh, probably follow that. Uh, okay. 
Okay. It's funny. I mean, that was that was a, a really popular application back in the well, certainly in the nineties. Uh, support to uh, to brokers and to trading, and I, I see evidence of it starting to get more interest. I guess probably due to the the, the much greater volume of data and information that's available, so it becomes even more relevant for their uh, for their analysis. But uh, we did um, a geo value case, which was um, done during COVID, where there was monitoring of the. Uh, um, of of the the crops and prediction of the crops, which was being used by the brokers as well as by the governments to uh, as a as a food security uh, issue. Um, I'm going to call a halt there. I'm pleased a number of people are, po are posting links into the chat. Um, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but it's certainly something we encourage and is becoming more and more. Uh, uh, prevalent, so an opportunity just to convey information and put um, promotional information in there, or, or whatever, you, any, anything you wish to share. It makes it a bit harder for me for uh, finding the questions, of course, and following the questions. But uh, I think on the whole, people uh, people benefit from it. So um, I'll draw this part of the uh, EO Cafe to uh, to a close. As you know, you know we still keep the uh, the cafe open, and anyone wishing to stay around and just have a chat and become even, an even more informal um, part of the meeting. Um, in two weeks' time, the next EO Cafe will be, um, we did a EO Cafe, I think it was six weeks ago, on um, around AI for EO. Um, here, we're going to be looking much more at AI for Copernicus, but digging more into the subject of AI and how it can uh, help the Earth observation sector, how it's relevant for the Earth observation observation sector. Uh, similarly with the Green Deal, we've said that this is a subject that's so, um, well, has so many layers to it, how many, so many, uh, so much complexity to it, that we come back to it. So again, at the end of uh, April, we'll have uh, the EO Cafe, which will look again at the Green Deal and the role of Earth observation and try and dissect a bit more what's going on with the Green Deal and how people can uh, um, could take opportunity for it or support uh, the the policy initiatives. So those are the next two uh, EO cafes. Um, I'm asked to uh, give a promotion on Expandio. Um, unfortunately, last year we had to postpone for obvious reasons. Um, we, we'll go ahead this year. Um, it will probably be virtual. I think it's middle of June. Uh, we're planning for it to be virtual. We would love to have some physical part to it, but I suspect that won't happen. Anyway, uh, keep um, follow the uh, the progress of Expandio, pre-register and get up to date. It will be a, a very significant meeting for the sector. Um, and the goal is very much looking at uh, uh, the markets for Earth observation and engaging with organizations who are perhaps the customers of the sector that Earth represent. So that's Expandio. Um, <laughs> another piece of publicity, Natasha, you're keeping me going here. Um, the uh, uh, FIRE what a project that we have, which is very much looking at uh, uh, market sectors and understanding what market sector um, out need from Earth observation, how they can benefit from Earth observation, whether it's urban monitoring, whether it's agriculture, as, uh, as um, was mentioned earlier. So um, we, as part of that program, we're looking for evangelists, uh, ideally evangelists that know something about the sector that they're representing, but not just. So uh, an evangelist for Earth observation. So if you have a particular skill in communicating, in uh, convincing others and communicating around the use of Earth observation for the benefit of different sectors. Um, apply for this exciting post of evangelist by the 16th of April. And then um, it's now just a question of thanking everybody. I really, I'm overawed by the, the time people spend with us. Um, I'm really, really happy that EO Cafe is able to uh, uh, provide this means of the community coming together around different subjects. We're always looking for more subjects. We've got a long list, but if you, uh, if you want to suggest something, we're very, very happy to take suggestions and maybe work with you to, uh, to build up the EO Cafe and to invite guests from 
different backgrounds and uh, sometimes it's um it's 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 really looking into the policy sometimes it's looking more into the technology sometimes it's looking more into the market so as those of you who've joined us on other occasions know it's very much uh, it's very open in terms of the topic so uh, a special thanks to uh, uh, to Remco and Jonathan for their insights today and for their their sharing i feel that uh, we may we may see both of them again Remco of course is a regular uh, in Ineo Cafe and uh, Jonathan uh, there was so much to talk about when we talked previously that uh, I feel sure that there's some more material that we could we could explore together so uh, that's that's it for this afternoon thank you very much I'm now off to get vaccinated so uh, that's my my news of the day and uh, uh, join you all uh, in two weeks time for the next Ineo Cafe wow. thanks bye-bye bye-bye